With safe zones secured and functioning across much of the globe, it was now time for humanity to resettle to this new reality, and the challenges that came with it. Even if they were at least somewhat protected from the dead, Resettling and reorganising millions of refugees in lands still blighted by the Great Panic and its after-effects was a challenge, and the United States provides a microcosm of how such problems were dealt with across the globe. For one thing, the government formed an entirely new division, the Department of Strategic Resources, or Distress, and Arthur Sinclair Jr. was its director and he had his work cut out for him. Despite the name, in a lot of regions, safe zone was being a bit generous. The West Coast area still had thousands of zombies from its main population centres, as well as occasional assaults on the mountain borders. On top of that, much of the interior was still ruined rubble, and the populace was starving, sick, and homeless people all needing assistance. At the start, those outside the safe zone were hardly missing out, and the first thing Sinclair needed to fix that was talent. Much of the First World is now a specialised post-industrial service-based economy. After an employment census to try and figure out who could do what, he had thousands of analysts, representatives, executives, and other fake-sounding job titles made for nepo babies and middle managers and not nearly enough carpenters, engineers, and masons. As Sinclair puts it, he needed to get a lot of white collars dirty. He devised a ranking system, with F6 possessing no valued vocation, and A1 being the most useful members. After he'd totted everything up, he had 65% F6, and so all of them that were physically able were first put on menial physical tasks clearing rubble, harvesting crops, and digging graves. Anyone A1 became part of a community self-sufficiency program, essentially teaching vital skills to anyone who had never worked anywhere but an office. And it worked. After the first three months, there was a marked drop in requests for government aids, as people formed up in communities now able to build their own settlements, acquire their own plumbing, and fix their own problems. There were still issues, though, and they were mainly social. Many of the blue-collar A1 workers were often first-generation immigrants, and as well as racism still clinging to humanity after the Great Panic, classism did too. For many arrogant attorneys or businessmen or rich suits, the people they'd once brazenly looked down on for fixing their toilet or mowing their lawn were now telling them what to do. Quite literally in some cases, with one famous former casting director now being instructed by her former cleaner. However, some were able to swallow their pride, and actually found more fulfilment in practical work than pushing numbers around a spreadsheet. Sinclair once met a former Don Draper type, who now worked as a Seattle chimney sweep, taking pride in keeping his neighbours warm. People were now able to directly see the fruits of their labour, and the enrichment that came with it. Heartwarming as it was, Sinclair still had a lot of other things he needed to fix. He believes resources, manufacturing, and logistics are what win wars, and now he was low on all three. Only able to use things in the West Coast safe zone now? He had at least some advantages with the richness of California's agricultural lands, although many surviving landowners were loath to give up their properties. Sinclair remembers a snapshot of one. Standing atop a vehicle, bellowing as he fired into hordes of zombies with a weapon in each hand, as they poured over his fences and tore into his cattle like army ants, every inch the true secessionist land baron with the personality to match. Sinclair gave him a choice, help out and receive government protection, or keep his lands, and receive nothing when hundreds of starving refugees descended on his herds, to finish what the dead started. He agreed, on the condition that his main breeding stock was spared. Sinclair was happy to oblige. What better food than prime rib to convince the public you were getting a lid on things again? The other raw material they had in spades was cars. With the global north's love of the automobile, they had constant shipments of every car imaginable flooding in from neighbours in the west, 
to be recycled to more useful products. Occasionally, some Humvee or sports car owner put up a fight, but many soon submitted, and they were both easy to deal with compared to the military. As the head of distress, Sinclair had carte blanche to order what he wanted to any rank, and was often met with staunch resistance. The insistence that tanks and stealth bombers and other insanely energy-intensive weapons should be spared. A tank couldn't justify the fuel cost, and what need was there for a stealth bomber against an enemy without radar? They needed boring, practical, and tough. Sinclair admits he made mistakes, like neglecting blimps despite their potency as anti-zombie aircraft, or spending too much time and money on nonsensical fantasy zombie-killing superweapons that he'd been convinced could win the war in 48 hours. Luckily, things smoothed out when Travis D'Ambrosia became chairman of the Joint Chiefs and implemented RKR, the resource-to-kill ratio. RKR was essentially the concept of getting the most bang for your buck, Things like semi-automatic rifles replacing automatic weapons. Why use a three or five round burst when all you needed was a single headshot? And rather than resistance, this was embraced by some of the military, especially the basic infantry, who Sinclair believes got a thrill from outsmarting the suits and bureaucrats with their own practical knowledge. They readily came up with their own ideas and weapons, one of which became the standard infantry entrenchment tool, better known as the lobotomizer, or Lobo for short. Ticking most of the major boxes their civilian survival guide claimed were needed to combat the undead, it was an ideal weapon. Looking like a cross between a battle axe and a shovel, 23 million were made from recycled cars in the war, and are still being made today as one of its most successful inventions. In Vermont, we meet the Wacko. Everyone calls him it now, so why not make it his formal introduction too? His fame came from being America's vice president during the war. This wasn't a job he initially wanted, instead arguing to his later elected president that all their resources had to go to just staying alive. The current president at the time had been hospitalised, and the Wacko believed it was no time for politicking and high ideals. His later leader disagreed, saying America didn't have the luxury of ancient traditions and old world pillars. All they had were the aspirations of what they wanted to be. The two got their later nicknames from some of the laws they made. One was the new punishment laws. People were now shamed for their crimes by public capital punishment, literally being whipped in the town square or put into stocks. Bizarre as it may sound, they couldn't afford to put able-bodied workers into prison, or even have prisons. They also found such tactics were an effective deterrent. With the communities built from Sinclair's earlier actions, no one wanted to be publicly shamed for stealing their neighbour's firewood. The Wacko also later agreed that a presidency and such high ideals were a good idea when he saw and heard of other countries having war criminals and similar types carve out their own kingdoms in the wastes that they then had to displace when they attempted to rebuild their own nations. In the US, they still had plenty political extremists, from religious fundamentalists to overzealous vegans that made for fun headlines but never posed a serious threat. Unlike the secessionists, they were the serious threat. Both the Wacko and the President were keen to eliminate them by any means necessary. Many either hated some aspect of the government to the point of violence anyway, or had been planning to secede prior to the apocalypse, and now had the chance. Dropping the hammer was the case inside the safe zone anyway. For those outside, it was a murkier issue. If you asked them, they said they didn't abandon America. America abandoned them. And the Wacko doesn't disagree, nor did the President. And despite trying to offer peaceful reintegration into America into the reclaiming portion of the war, many refused, as is understandable, and there was sometimes considerable violence, the guilt of which took a heavy toll on the President and Wacko alike. With Sinclair's self-sufficiency programs resulting in people who could look after themselves, this included self-protection too, 
and Joe Muhammad was a proud member of his neighbourhood security. Whilst he now has a more peaceful day job owning a bike repair shop and the hobby of metal sculpting, he saw plenty of action back in the day, and his wheelchair didn't hold him back. When initially volunteering to be a part of the neighbourhood security though, it almost did thanks to the recruiter. Initially unwilling to let him be part of the volunteer force, Muhammad kicked off, and soon enough he had his orange vest. He views such concerns as asinine. The main duty of the neighbourhood security was literally just checking in on your neighbours, to make sure everyone was safe and no one had seen anything decaying and humanoid nearby. And if they did, you could always rely on them to come to you. No need for a chase. At least three people per unit had to have firearms, and a new policy on their side of the Rockies was a designated night watchman per house too, typically being the ones neighbourhood security linked up with on patrol. The early days were chaotic in multiple ways. Muhammad suddenly had a family of six in his house too, who made it over the checkpoint from Alabama just in time. He didn't mind. In retrospect, he wonders why he even needed such a big pre-war house anyway, and felt better having them around. On the job, despite being cleared safe, much of the West Coast wasn't exempt from the Great Panic, and was still infested. Plenty zombies still roamed the safe zone, and many towns were deserted and needed clearing. An early goal was doing general sweeps of the houses to clear out the ghouls. Muhammad typically waited outside with his rifle whilst his colleagues went inside. But even then, he almost got bit himself once. His partner was taking a leak when he felt something tugging on the chair, and found a dragger trying to pull itself over the wheels to get at him. He still views himself as lucky though. If the chair hadn't intercepted it, it could have just bitten his calf straight away. As would be the case through much of the war, Zombies weren't the only problem, and there were plenty of looters and squatters. Many of these willingly entered the fold of the safe zone when offered, but a few refused to cooperate. Muhammad's closest shave on the job came from a person over a zombie, when they were chased out of a house and refused to freeze as Muhammad ordered. In the exchange of fire, Muhammad took a 9 mil through the shoulder. His opponent wasn't so lucky. Then there were the ferals. Typically children abandoned, lost or orphaned in the Great Panic, they had gone wild living in the rubble and the countryside. Many were often sick and malnourished, but still panicked on seeing people and often tried to flee. When they couldn't catch them and the kids just ran off into the dangerous wilderness again, was the only time Muhammad wished he wasn't in a wheelchair. But the most tragic and threatening facet of living humanity encountered were the Quislings. Named for Norwegian leader Vidkun Quisling, who collaborated with the Nazis in World War II, the Quislings were still living people, who had undergone a severe psychological condition that led them to believe they were already zombies themselves. The Quislings were still living people, who had undergone a severe psychological condition that led them to believe they were already zombies themselves. In some ways, they were arguably more dangerous than the genuine article, they could repair their bodies, and gain strength and stamina from the other humans they ate. Their functioning metabolism also allowed them to stay active in winter too. Despite not possessing any solanum in their system, their mouths still contained lethal amounts of bacteria, and the first one ever discovered by Muhammad and his team almost killed the person it mauled with a staph infection, which really rained on his parade when he thought he'd dodged certain death. As well as winter activity, they could also be differentiated from real zombies by body heat, their flowing blood, and the blink test. Every so often, or if bright lights were shone in their eyes, Quislings still blinked. But how does one even become a Quisling? And it's hard to say, as they couldn't be interviewed, despite government attempts to round them up and keep them fed and cared for, in a controversial private facility. But being one does seem similar to either Stockholm Syndrome, where one develops an attachment to their captors, or Cotard Syndrome, where one believes they're already dead. 
It's worth noting neither are actually formally recognised by the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders first, but published literature does exist on both of them to draw from, alongside heavy criticism. In Stockholm Syndrome, some key criteria suggested included a negative feeling towards authorities, positive feelings towards their hostage takers, and said feelings reciprocated by the hostage taker although the latter has numerous incidents where this wasn't the case. This does fit the Quislings, as zombies never show much emotion other than moaning and snapping and general cannibal vibes. Their negative feelings towards authorities does as well, as post Yonkers there was general widespread disillusionment and even hostility to the government, tremendously so on the other side of the Rockies, so that matches negative feelings towards authorities. The saddest part may come from positive feelings towards the hostage takers. It could well be that in some Quislings, their mental transformation came after a catastrophic psychotic break, following them directly witnessing their closest loved ones reanimate to become undead. Other assessments do also match the general psychological atmosphere following an apocalypse. Many studies of Stockholm Syndrome also lack a clear set of ideals and goals in life, or lack identity and personal faith, as well as wishing to be someone else and being unhappy with their life, all fairly understandable things to feel in an undead world. In Cotard Syndrome, recorded cases are often associated with brain dysfunction, so it could be that the Quislings are those who suffered similar dysfunctions either prior or during stages of the war, that then had their syndrome realigned to the walking dead over just being dead full stop. One paper describes it as a depressed person's attempt to account for abnormal perceptual experiences, and that it has heavy overlap with other misidentification syndromes. So maybe Quislings are those unable to accept the zombies up until a breaking point. Perhaps Quislings were those trapped alone, surrounded by just the undead. The Civilian Survival Guide also warns of the potential psychological devastation caused by the constant moaning of a besieging horde. All they could see were human faces that were no longer human. The constant stress of the threat of the undead, the sleep deprivation caused by their moaning, and the isolation eventually caused them to misidentify the dead as base humanity, and if they were human, then thus they had to believe themselves as dead too. Most tragic of all, the attempts to join the undead ranks were not recognised by the actual zombies themselves. It's been suggested that the early idiotic beliefs phalanx actually worked was due to quizlings, as well as hopeful reports of the zombies fighting among themselves. But such fights were really more one-sided events of predation, as the Quislings wouldn't fight back against the actual zombies. They'd simply spasm and convulse on the floor as they lost control of their bodies in the blood loss and disembowelment, steadily devoured alive by the subhuman monsters they'd destroyed their own minds to be. Roy Elliott is naturally at home in Malibu, California, and was something of a minor celebrity pre-war too. Post-war, his status and influence have increased dramatically, and he was one of the few of Sinclair's F6s who actually managed to cling on to some semblance of their pre-war life. A severe killer in the early days was asymptomatic death syndrome or its more colourful title, some gave it, of Apocalyptic Despair Syndrome. Healthy people went to sleep and never woke up, killed by the mounting psychological stress of living through a zombie apocalypse. And this is in a way a real thing. Stress cardiomyopathy is a drastic and often fatal, but still reversible, weakening of the heart muscles, due to severe emotional stress. Whilst well understood medically and how to treat it, it's not as well known mentally as to how our feelings can literally damage our hearts. In the safe zone, part of it, Elliot was certain of, came from the general despair and lack of hope for the future. Even if they'd survived, what chance was there for anything even resembling a normal life anymore? And not just getting swarmed again. As such, by the dozen, people's hearts were just losing hope. 
Elliot believed this was his enemy to fight, and proudly marched straight to the government to convince them to let him make his films again. He was turned down. But they did ask for his autograph, at least. Despite Elliot's belief that actually having propaganda films would help let the public see what they were doing to get a quality of life back, and the insistence it wouldn't cost them anything, he was still refused, multiple times even. He had no choice but to grab his eldest son and mountain bike across the country in their spare time, trying to find a story to film himself on whatever budget he could scrape together. He didn't have to go far to find it. In Claremont, just outside of LA, there were five colleges that decided to stand and fight in the Great Panic. They turned the women's college at Scripps into their fortress, with vegetable gardens, walls, and wells. With makeshift weapons from gardening tools and sport rifles, they held off over 10,000 zombies over the course of four months. Elliot and his son got there just in time for the ending, to film smiling students and soldiers dispatch the last of the ghouls and link arms, smiling beneath a star-spangled banner flying from one of the college towers. They cut together their 96 hours of footage, and Elliot's wife narrated, and they screened it in camps and shelters all over LA. Victory at Avalon, the Battle of the Five Colleges. And it bombed. No one seemed to care, and Elliot decided he'd have to get a real job after all. Two weeks into his work helping reopen roads at Topanga, he was visited by a psychiatrist from Santa Barbara. It turns out that ADS cases had dropped by over 5% in areas where his film had been shown. It seemed Elliot was right, and that that glimmer of hope was actually worth a lot. They then started making more copies, and created a 10% drop in the entire Western Rockies safe zone. Three films later and a 23% drop in ADS, and the government began to take a genuine notice in his talents. They weren't going to burn any real resources on him, but most importantly, they finally allowed him to play in the military toolbox, especially their Fire of the Gods, Elliot's landmark film. Laser cannons sound every bit as fictitious as zombies, but whilst they aren't used to zap humans into atoms like in futuristic scenarios, they do both exist and actually have valid uses in active combat. Vastly powerful lasers are used to literally burn through missiles and mortars, detonating them in mid-air. They're also suggested to have anti-vehicle uses too, potentially destroying enemy jets or trucks, and they can successfully zap drones out of the sky. Unsurprisingly, there is little in the literature on what happens if you fire one at a human. But, considering the fact lasers can be used to cut metal, and such military lasers can successfully burn drone and missiles apart in mid-air, it may not be so far-fetched that you could literally auric goldfinger someone with them. And that's just what Elliot filmed them doing. The smaller Zeus was effectively just a giant laser like those used for welding. Initially made for mine clearance, when fired on its highest setting at a zombie forehead, it could punch straight through. At the lower settings, it just heated the tissues to the point of boiling the brain. Already, they were getting some insane footage that wouldn't look out of place in some sci-fi shooter, but it was nothing compared to Emthel, the mobile tactical high-energy laser, using deuterium fluoride chemicals when used on its strongest capacity, it incinerated zombies out and out, literally turning them into smoke and dust. This was incredible in real time, but in slow motion it really was fire of the gods. So was America ready to kick zombie ass with their new Skynet mega lasers? No. Much as the basic concept of shadow puppets shows us, things can get in the way of light to diminish its use. Poor weather conditions could fumble it, as could the smoke, vapour and other particles made by incinerating zombies with them. Similarly, if they used it on too many zombies at once, the laser would overheat and lose effectiveness or even break too. So not really ideal for literally evaporating a giant horde, especially with the amount of fuel that would take. On top of that, they were really expensive to both build and use, 
as well as being pretty fragile and literally requiring a fleet of skilled operators and technicians to use on their fleet of trucks to transport them. They literally needed armed forces to defend their supposed superweapons. In our times too, tactical high-energy lasers have been shelved for bulkiness and lacklustre results, as well as a $300 million budget eating into resources. The hope of either of them ever passing distress qualifications was minuscule. They looked fantastic, but they were next to useless at actually zapping zombies. But they looked fantastic, and that was all Elliot needed. People saw Fire of the Gods time and time again. Some even suggested it halved ADS, although Elliot believes that may be an exaggeration. Ironically, this shows no one actually learned anything from Yonkers. The technology they now worshipped was useless flashy showboating, the exact thing that lost them Yonkers and, in essence, the country with it. Yet one flash of a fancy superweapon annihilating a ghoul, and everyone was convinced they were in good hands now. Efficiency, facts, and other such nonsense didn't matter. It just looked really cool. So really, America secured the next stage of the war the exact same way they lost it. Psychologically. One of the people most affected by the sweeping changes in military strategy and hardware reforms was Christina Eliopoulos. Now a squadron commander, and former blimp pilot Gavin Blair's commanding officer, she used to be an F-A-22 Raptor pilot, a monument to humanity's technical prowess and America's air superiority that, against the dead in this new war, was now completely worthless. Anything with a monstrously expensive jet engine like a Raptor, or indeed huge swaths of the Air Force, were mothballed in the Arizona desert, and Eliopolis watched her lifelong dream she'd fought her whole life to obtain, and then master, get rolled into a dusty warehouse. Distress even suggested that the Air Force had the worst resource-to-kill ratio of any branch of the military, and Eliopolis is still bitter. But it was still America. The Air Force fleet wasn't scrapped, just rendered dormant. Once the undead were dealt with, you never know when your next war was going to be. What was left was airlift and transport, chiefly prop-powered aircraft. Pilots had gone from flying the closest thing on Earth to an X-Wing to being glorified sky truckers. Their routes were into the east of the Rockies, the land now fully occupied by the undead, and other than just the grey seas of zombie territory, there were still small points of interest. Red zones were points of critical interest, like mines, power plants, or certain factories. These were some of the rare things the army had left their men to defend after pulling back to the safe zone. The blue zones were successful human colonies that had managed to band together, and were now functioning as communities on their own. The army still supplied them using the air force, rather with self-sustaining tools than consumables. Although at the end of autumn, food, medicine and baby powder were dropped to help them withstand the winter too. Sometimes both blue and red zones needed specialists. People even more valuable than Sinclair's A1s, like specialist doctors or engineers. They were extensively trained for it, and knew the risks. Some people who went into such zones found them overrun, and never came back out again. Purple zones were for the pilots like Eliopolis, and were their refuel and repair zones, an official sounding title for what were often just abandoned and undefended runways. But they still helped bring the overall survival rates for aircraft to 92%. The other 8% unfortunately included Eliopolis. She never found out what brought her down. Maybe mechanical failure, maybe freak weather maybe unstable cargo as had happened before. All she knew was that she was zipping back up after taking a leak due to the diuretic stimulants they got given, before there was a blast of high-powered air and she was sucked out through the destroyed back of the plane. She pulled her parachute cord and tried to radio her crew to escape, but she only saw one other parachute deploy as their plane went down. The flight was from Phoenix to Tallahassee, and Eliopolis figured she was roughly somewhere over southern Louisiana, 
Descending into it, it looked like a swampy wilderness without end. She still landed safely, and had been trained for such events. The Air Force had a program in the Californian mountains to bring recruits up to shape, including using captured zombies to make sure they were up to combat standard against the undead. Her first priority was tracking her crewmate should see an escape, and still shaken by their crash, she forgot all the rules. And wetlands are considered some of the worst zombie encounter environments possible. Splashing water both gives away your presence and covers approaching undead. The shallow water and mud can often hide zombies that can reach out to attack, and venomous or predatory wildlife can be a threat too. Not so much in a class 4 situation. And Eliopolis finds the bones of an old bull alligator brought down by a horde of ghouls. Eliopolis forgets to stick to the dry ground, and ignores the fleeing birds. It's by luck that her co-pilot had distracted the undead to allow her to approach. When she found him, he was already gone. His parachute and harness had gotten stuck and snared him in the trees, and a pack of five zombies feasted on him from where they could reach below the ribs. Eliopolis deals with the pack, but loses it completely. She wasted her ammo in the bodies, and risked giving her position away, kicking and screaming at their remains. If it wasn't for her radio, she may have never left that spot. A woman's voice, a civilian's, asks if there is anyone there that survived the wreck. She was a sky watcher, a series of amateur civilian ham radio operators trying to help out by reporting on aircraft issues wherever they could, and she identified herself as Mets fan. She told Eliopolis they'd reported the incident, and she needed to get to the nearest viable location for a rescue team to grab her. She then helps Eliopolis regather her bearings, reminding her that she's flown this route hundreds of times before, and Eliopolis pins herself roughly around the Atchafalaya Basin, and roughly a day or so away from the I-10 highway, her best shot for a pickup. Finally, Mets fan asks if there's anything she forgot before she sets off, and she remembers her co-pilot, who had just started to reanimate. Eliopolis puts a round between his eyes before her voyage. This time, she does things properly, sticking to solid ground and playing it cautious with her senses sharp. Mets fan reminds her to stay off the road. Even if a trapped zombie in a car can't grab you, it can still give away your position by moaning. Eliopolis found the best wilderness track she could and kept going. Despite the risky terrain, it could have been a lot worse. Metzvan reminds her that she's walking between two blue zones of Lafayette and Baton Rouge, which were pulling most of the undead in either direction away from her. She also warns her away from a vehicle, but Eliopolis's natural curiosity had returned with her improved mood, and she went for an explore. It turned out to be an SUV, and a well-stocked one at that. A survivalist's feast. A rifle with hundreds of still-boxed rounds, endless food with utensils to cook it, a nice tent and sleeping bag? What more could one want? The will to keep going was seemingly the answer. The driver was still in seat, revolver still in hand, and a clear hole straight through his skull. There were no bites or slain zombies surrounding him. He had just given up. Eliopolis was keen to grab some of the gear, until Mets fan intervened. The rifle wasn't silenced, but her pistol already was. If she was only there for a day or so, what did she need that food for? Likewise with the tent, and she'd have to stop moving to prepare it as well. After she decided to take a brief minute anyway, Mets fan claimed she heard something on the last transmission and as soon as Eliopolis saw the first zombie, she was already surrounded. She scrambled to the car roof to regain her composure, before dropping the swarm one by one. Some time later, she's surrounded by 61 slain zombies, with no more seemingly coming. A victory, but as Metzfan pointed out, one that had cost her the chance of being evacuated that day. She found a good enough tree and pitched her hammock, before taking a pair of sleeping pills and passing out for the night. She woke up to over a hundred zombies underneath her. Luckily, the marshy ground had prevented them from forming a ramp up to her, 
but she was still in serious trouble. According to the map, the I-10 was in striking distance. She had to jump for it and run. On landing, she cracks her ankle on a submerged rock, another danger of swamps, and only landing face down in the water stops her from blacking out. Metz fan now just screamed at her to run, as she could barely limp ahead of the decaying horde now in hot pursuit. Metz fan becomes increasingly hostile, as she pressures her into hauling ass up the ramp to the highway. But mercifully at the top, Eliopolis sees a black spot in the sky. She looses her signal flare, and the helicopter descends. But when on board, it's a civilian helicopter, who doesn't know anything about her crash landing. They were just doing a routine shuttle between Baton Rouge and Lafayette. Eliopolis thanks Metz fan profusely, but is just met with silence from there on out. Eliopolis believes her to be a former pilot herself. That was the only way she could have known all the flight terminology and similar experiences to Eliopolis. Except they never found the cabin, or her, or had any record of a Skywatcher with the name Metz fan, and that Eliopolis's radio had broken on impact. Eliopolis denies the psych report, and is adamant that Metz fan is real, or was. Whether she was a pilot, knew one, raised one, or was married to one, she believes she was just a scared, lonely voice, keen to prevent anyone else from winding up like her. She was there when Eliopolis needed her, and would be with her forevermore. Maybe Eliopolis is right, maybe she isn't. Between Metz fan, Red Decker's suggested stories, and the Quislings, the war provided people with a set of stimuli they'd never really faced before and a set of challenges to the human psyche, likely never really seen outside severe active combat and prisoner of war camps, with myriad ways for civilians to react to them. People coped how they coped, and if it kept Eliopolis alive, then Metz fan did their job, no matter who they really were. Thanks for watching. And thanks to my patrons, the Super Stuper, Samburgo, Kaysandum, Holden, Nickname 3110, Erengar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Hui Hui, Original Username, Evilly, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Last Name, Zesa, Dodekablos, and Bazugazu Bachuhatsu Bachumatsu, for their generosity in helping keep the channel going. A huge thanks to the collaborating artists too, for greatly embellishing this video with their work. To Mana for creating the Victory at Avalon poster, to CJ Broskin for creating the Fire of the Gods poster, and to Shockall for creating the image of Eliopolis lost in the swamps with her co-pilot getting eaten. The chapters they illustrated were pretty dependent on their custom artwork, and I'm very grateful for their excellent efforts. Links are provided in the description to more of their work and their websites too. I think Homefront USA is one of the best chapters in the story, with some of the best and most interesting and entertaining concepts in it too. Its chief flaw is one I'd say oddly Max Brooks himself points out, about the whole book really, in that it's very America-centric. He makes a tongue-in-cheek jab at the zombie survival guide being as such, and then proceeds to have a whole America chapter anyway, whereas the rest of the world combined gets just one and then has a lot of American chapters outside of that too. But with that said, a lot of the concepts explored, like safe zones and the Quislings, could have been written anywhere really, and did occur worldwide. But it still would have been nice to have a greater exploration of how the rest of the world did things too, which will be the next and longest video coming soon.